Hello, this is, I'm Dr. Joseph Knippenberg, and this is Oglethorpe University's uh, annual uh, celebration slash commemoration of Constitution Day. Constitution Day is uh, an event mandated by uh, federal law of every educational institution that receives uh, federal funding. Uh, I think it's a wonderful thing that educational institutions uh, focus people's attention on the Constitution, encourage them to study and think about the Constitution. And I'm very grateful that the Jack Miller Center uh, has for a long time uh, provided very generous support to Oglethorpe's uh, events celebrating Constitution Day. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, our speakers, uh, our keynote speaker, Elizabeth Coffer bush and the respondents, uh, Drs. Dan Cullen and David Crockett. So uh, Elizabeth Coffer bush is the Laura and Pete Walker Professor in the Department of Leadership and American Studies at Christopher Newport University in Newport News. Uh, she knows Atlanta well, having uh, received her undergraduate degree from uh, Emory University and then going off to Michigan State University for her PhD and then returning to Atlanta, teaching various places in uh, the Atlanta metropolitan area, including Oglethorpe. Uh, she is the Director of American Studies and Co-Director of the Center for American Studies at Christopher Newport and is the author of uh, numerous articles and co-author of a book on Title IX entitled Title IX, The Transformation of Sex Discrimination in Education. Uh, Dan Cullen is Professor of Philosophy at Rhodes College in Memphis and Director there of the Project for the Study of uh, Liberal Democracy. He is also Fellow in Constitutional Studies at the Jack Miller Center and as such is uh, the person responsible for all of Jack Miller's support of Constitution Day program. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree from McGill University in Montreal, his PhD from Boston College. He's the author of numerous articles and of, uh, ed, author also of Freedom and Rousseau's Political Philosophy and editor at least of this book or most recently of this book, Liberal Democracy and Liberal Education. Uh, David Crockett, our other respondent, is professor and chair of political science at Trinity University in San Antonio. Received his BA from Georgetown University, his master's and PhD degrees from a university that uh, aspires to join the S Southeastern Conference, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, received rather rude welcome recently from uh, Arkansas. The author of numerous articles and uh, two books, The Opposition Presidency, Leadership and the Constraints of History, and Against the Grain, How Opposition Presidents Win the White House. Without further ado, I'm going to turn my microphone off and hand you over to Professor Bush. Thank you for that introduction, and thanks to the Jack Miller Center for supporting these events. Um, as Dr. Knippenberg said, uh, we're celebrating Constitution Day today, and I thought it worth asking, um, you know, why the Constitution? So we're commemorating the signing of the Constitution in 1787. Well, the Constitution is the law of the land. Um, the concept of rule of law is something that I want to talk about today. And the Constitution is something that um, not everybody today respects the way they should. Um, and so I would like us, you know, my personal motive is to get back to that. So among the topics we'll be talking today about is what is the rule of law? And this leads me to the title. Um, I call this the separation of powers or the normalization of tyranny because we have this choice. Um, the separation of powers and constitutional development as intended by the founding generation or the normalization of tyranny. So I'm going to argue today that the separation of powers is an essential component of the rule of law. I will argue that administrative laws it's currently made has the greatest potential to be both tyrannical and incompetent 
And what I mean by administrative law is I'm talking about bureaucratic agencies in the executive department, that administrators or bureaucrats, when they are interpreting or enforcing the law today, a lot of them are actually making law. And this is a point I'll come to at the very end of the talk. Um, they make law, they interpret law, and they enforce law, and they determine punishments um, for breaking of said laws. So the bureaucracy today represents a violation of the separation of powers at the utmost ex uh, extent. And in Federalist Papers 47 through 51, I would argue that Madison and the Federalists are arguing that maintaining a proper understanding of the separation of powers is the key to um, uh, promoting the rule of law and preventing tyrannical government. So my talk has three parts. First, I'm gonna lay out the roots of the Federalist definition of tyranny, roots in Locke and Montesquieu. And uh, this really began because I thought the Federalist definition of tyranny in Fed 47 was somewhat strange. And so it made me want to think about it a little bit more. After talking about what tyranny is or what constitutes tyranny, then I'm going to discuss the Federalist protections against tyranny with a special focus on separation of powers and why those are so important. And then finally, I'm going to touch on briefly the hidden threat from the bureaucracy today um, by using an example or a case study. The US Constitution's nature, it's Republican nature, and by Republican, as I'm going to use it today, I'm not talking about a political party, I'm talking about um, Republican as consent-based governance and rights protection. Its nature as a Republican government with separation of powers, divided sovereignty, these things aim to prevent two main things, tyrannical government, and I would also say incompetent government, uh, it's hard to say which is worse, uh, equally, equally dangerous. Now, uh, while some of the Federalist foes, the Anti-Federalist critique the system's unnecessary complexity, and I think that the Federalist Papers is um, one of the areas where, uh, um, sorry, I had a child right next to me who no, was, who was trying to communicate to me. Um, they saw the separation of powers as one of the most unnecessarily complex areas of the Federalist Papers. While some of the Anti-Federalists uh, critique this complexity, the Federalists insist not only that their constitution is decisively Republican, um, but also that their constitution, um, uh, that its proposed blending of authority among the branches is the best way to secure a true separation of powers. Um, that you can't maintain the powers to be absolutely separate, but you need to blend them and we'll talk about that. Federalist Papers 47 through 51 outline the separation of powers among the constituent parts. The proper division and balance of authority, Madison explains, is the key to avoiding tyrannical and incompetent government. And to punctuate this, um, he defines the centrality of preserving separate and distinct branches as tyranny. Tyranny is the polar opposite of separate branches. Quote, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary in the same set of hands whether by one, a few, or many, because it doesn't have to be a single individual. I think a lot of times we mistakenly believe that a tyrant is a single individual who holds a lot of authority, but it could be the many just as well. And also whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. And that's from Fed 47. And when the power the whole power of two branches gets enmeshed together or three branches. He says, quote, the fundamental principles of a free constitution are subverted. So you have on the one hand separation of powers juxtaposed to the very definition of tyranny. And I always found it a little bit odd. Um, so we'll get to that. Now, moving to the 21st century, subversion of the separation of powers is applauded as standard operating procedure in what has become known as the administrative state or what I called administrative lawmaking. Frustrated by a broken Congress, President Barack Obama famously argued, 
uh, for the authority to consolidate the federal bureaucracy. He famously said, um, you know, if Congress can't get their act together, I'll do it alone. And one of the ways is through the bureaucracy. This is not new to um, President Obama, and it's not unique to the Democratic Party side. You see it on both sides of the aisle. When a president steps in, they act as if the lawmaking powers, they're in their authority, and they use the powers of the executive branch to enact laws the way they would like to see them, whether, rather than how they're written. While such prerogatives may seem wise in the short term, or in the cases uh, when the president is of the party that we happen to prefer, um, you know, folks see no problem with it. But this is not really a benign action and nor is it necessary. Indeed, um, I would argue that those who remain ignorant to the administrative states predominance may need a refresher course on why the separation of powers is deemed necessary. So let's turn to that. Let's start with the definition of tyranny. According to John Locke, section 199, I know some of you are reading the second treatise of government. Actually, in uh, one of my favorite courses at Oglethorpe, the human nature course and the social order, which I actually had the pleasure to teach while I was there. Um, Locke argues that tyranny is, quote, the exercise of power beyond right. When you exercise power beyond your right to do so, and he says nobody can have a right to do that. And this making use of power anyone has in his hands, not for the good of those under it, but for his own separate advantage. So there he says something else. You have to think about the good of those who are under the government. government. And then he goes a further step. He says, when the governor, however entitled, makes not law, but his will. So you may have legitimate authority to make law, but if you do so and only enact your will as the rule, and his commands and actions are not directed to the preservation of the properties of the people, the proper end of the government, but the satisfaction of his own ambition, revenge, covetedness, or any other irregular passion. That too is tyranny. So we learn a couple of things or a couple of components. We're juxtaposing rule of law with capricious will. So the rule of law or legitimate authority or legitimate law has two components. One is it has to be oriented toward the proper end goal. We know for Locke that's preservation of property. Secondly, what's interesting and, and new is that it has a definite structure. It can't just be whatever the leader wants, even if they have legitimate um, authority to do so. So this is where process matters. So if you ever hear someone say, and this might cause us to roll, roll our eyes, I'm a process person. They're, they're hitting at the second part of what Locke's talking about, that rule of law is not just the right end, it's how you get there. And I think that how you get there is what a lot of people are frustrated with today. They want to just subvert and, and ignore it because it's people can't compromise, we're polarized and so forth but both components are part of the rule of law. So tyranny then falls into two categories. Either you're violating the end goals, you're failing to preserve the property of the governed as Locke would say, um, or you're violating the process or set parameters that can be used to enact law. Now, why is this process so important and what do we learn from Locke and what do the Federalists take from this? We're inclined to tyranny, the capricious will when we have power because human beings are flawed. I think Locke puts it, and I haven't taught this in several years, no fair observers of equity and justice, I think is a paraphrase of, of how he puts it. Um, that you can't expect people to behave well when they have power in their hands. And even more so when you give them too much power. Um, Montesquieu, takes it another step closer um, to what the Federalists say. He juxtaposes similarly despotic rule and rule of law. They're complete opposites. But then Montesquieu associates tyranny explicitly with the failure to separate powers. Now think about this for a second. 
if you put lawmaking, legislative, executive enforcing, and judging judicial authority in one set of hands, why is that tyranny? We can only understand it as tyranny if you expect that person to do something bad with all that power. It's because of the lowness of human nature that this is how we define tyranny. And that leads us to Federalist 47. Quote, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary in the same set of hands, whether one few or many, or whether heredity, self-employed or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. So if this is what tyranny is, and I, and I think we have a little light shed on, on why this is the definition, what are the proper end goals and how do we preserve this liberty? Um, the end goals aren't talked about in great detail in the Constitution, you do have the preamble, and it has some um, uh, exhortive language, such as establish justice, provide for domestic tranquility, and so forth. And that's about as close as you get to the end goals. So I would say the preamble of the Constitution, and also the Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence a little more clearly touches on the end goals of rule of law to secure our liberties, governments are instituted amongst men, the law of nature and nature does God teach us these things that we are endowed by a creator with unalienable rights among these life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Locke called it preservation of property. This is a, a little more expansive, but the declaration doesn't go on to list all of our um, unalienable rights. Nevertheless, suffice it to say, Securing these rights is the proper end goal, the rights of the governed, and that the authority to do so can only come from the consent of the governed. Now, it's the Constitution that tells us the form part of rule of law. How do you do this? So the Declaration has a, a, a discussion of what the end goals are. The Constitution goes into detail on, on how. What's the form? What's the procedure? What's the process? So the thesis of Federalist Papers 47 to 51 um, is that the only way to avoid tyranny, given the vicissitudes, I'm, I mean, you might say the lowness of human nature or the flawed, let's just say flawed, we're, not, we're imperfect, is to construct the institutions of government in a way to neutralize the natural threat posed by individuals in power. And it's worth noting, the Federalist Papers themselves don't really say much about what good leadership is. It's a, it's a very trendy thing today to have courses and programs on being a great leader, on what a leader is. The Federalists focus on how to avoid the worst leader possible. <laughs> um, how we can prevent, is assume the worst, and let's make that person um, beneficial to us in some way. So there are numerous steps that have to be taken. First of all, you have to have a republic and Federalist 39 talks about this, but that's not enough. You also have to have federalism. You have to divide the sovereignty between state and national units. That's not enough. You need an enumeration of powers at the national level. That itself is a great protection because you only list the authorities that are there and anything not listed, it's assumed, is not in their authority. So enumeration of powers, that's not enough. Um, you also have to separate the power, separate lawmaking from enforcing, from judging. But separating the powers isn't enough because you need to protect that separation and you do so by blending the powers, what we sometimes call checks and balances. And then I would add rule of law that uh, settled laws applying to everybody. So there's multiple layers given what you might call the loneliness or the flawed nature of human beings requires so many layers of protection. So let's just unpack this briefly. Republicanism, Fed 39. Um, really fascinating paper worth a, worth a close look. I'm gonna spend about 30 seconds on it though. They say the essential feature of republicanism and why our constitution as a republic derives all its powers directly or indirectly from the great body of the people. That indirectly part, 
is where the Federalists diverge from some of the Enlightenment thinkers upon which they base their arguments. Um, after he says, uh, so this is consent-based governance. This is, this is the declaration. But in addition to that, he goes on to say, um, it's sufficient, it's enough um, for such a government that the persons administering it, they could be appointed, um, they could be appointed directly or indirectly by the people. So it doesn't all have to be direct voting. Um, and another important element of this is there has to be a way to remove them from office. So their appointments need to be temporary or for limited terms. And I love how they throw this in or good behavior. Um, so an appointment to the Supreme Court is not an appointment for life. It's as long as they exhibit good behavior. Um, so they're trying to make the case that there are multiple ways someone could come into the office that still uphold consent base, even if it's, a, if it's as far removed as being appointed and sitting for good behavior. And by the way, Fed 39 also, um, bans titles of nobility. Hamilton seems to think that's very important to, to highlight as well, to, to get rid of um, some of the historical uh, titles and such. So after we get a Republican, or at least you know the sufficient features of Republicanism, federalism, we reserve some powers for the states and local units and some powers for the national government in Fed 45 they clarify that the national government is mostly going to deal with war and national security. If you look at the Fed papers as a whole, a lot of them focus on national security because that was a failing of the articles. And then they anticipated, we could see whether this is still true or not, or talk about it, that the states would focus on more of the daily ordinary course of affairs um, in the lives, liberties, and properties of the people, the internal order, uh, prosperity of the state. That's Fed 45. So now we get to the crux of the matter, the separate and blended powers. Uh, the Federalists argue to avoid tyranny, you've got to not only have a separate lawmaker from those who enforce the law, from those who judge when there are violations, but you need to what, do what Madison calls blend the powers. And what he means by this blending is each branch gets a piece of the other branch's authority. Let me explain this. I think it's a fascinating um, argument entrenched in their understanding of human nature. A concentration of these powers is tyranny. That's how they define it. So you have to decentralize these powers. But you can't have an absolute wall of separation between the two because then they don't have a way to enforce um, uh, the other branches to stay in their lane. So he, they say you need two things to prevent tyranny once you separate the power. First, each branch or individuals in each branch need the means to resist one another, the tools, the ability, the authority to resist encroachment on the others. And secondly, you need the motives to resist encroachment from one another. So as to the first, the means to resist one another, this is what your textbooks, and I'm happy to say in the class you're taking with Professor Knippenberg, I know you don't use textbooks. Um, uh, the means to resist each other is a share of each other's power. So you give the president the veto, right? And so the veto is a last ditch effort to stop a bad law from getting passed, theoretically speaking, okay? But then, you know, maybe that's a lot of power to give one individual because the president is one person. So you give Congress, who are the elected uh, representatives of the people, the ability to override that veto if they feel very strongly about it. And then you get the, give the judiciary the, the ability to look at a law if it's challenged and question whether it's consistent with the Constitution itself. And so each branch has a piece of lawmaking power to ensure that no branch goes too far in their authority. Um, it allows the president to threaten the uh, Congress from getting out of their lane, but Congress can threaten the president 
um, from getting out of their lane if, if he's vetoing, he or she is vetoing everything. Then you also have impeachment. The elected officials in the House have the sole power of impeachment. This is a good trick question. I, I don't give trick questions and it's not really a trick question, but uh, the House has the authority, not Congress, the House to impeach and the Senate holds a trial. Senate, senators who were originally appointed. As to the motives to resist one another, to keep each branch from becoming too powerful, well, that lies in human nature. No person wants to have less power than they have. They always are going to want more. And because of pride, no president is gonna to wanna to look like Congress is walking all over them. And no Congress is gonna to wanna to look like they have to abide by everything the president has to say. Each branch is allocated the necessary tools by which to exercise their own authority, but also to control the misdeeds of others. Each will be provided with a measure of the other's authority in order to prevent any one branch from usurping the other's power. And so it's an interesting exercise to look at um, who appoints the judges? That's a check on the courts, right? Uh, but the Senate confirms. And so you see a lot of intermingling. And this is the aspect that um, some of the anti-federalists found distasteful. It's so complicated. Why does it have to be so complicated? Can't we be straightforward and simple? And, and the short answer is no, because we can't comprehend the depths to which human nature might descend if you give them inability to grasp absolute power. The three powers of the national government, they need to cooperate with one another, but they're also power seeking. So they're going to have to, with these tools, check one another and learn to work together. Now we can look around today and talk about how well that's working. Um, to sum it up, and this is maybe one of the most eloquent uh, statements of Madison, um, uh, from Fed 51, it may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the, the abuses of government. So I'm gonna give you a little anecdote. Um, I was in a faculty meeting once and we were discussing the faculty handbook and certain revisions and certain revisions that would bring um, higher administration into faculty committees of, of one sort or another. And I said, well, I'm a constitutionalist and uh, one has to think about um, the administrators one might have in the future. We may all love our administrators now and trust them with additional authority, but you have to um, assume that your enemy will have that power and do you want to make these changes to, to the laws? And just to um, highlight that this is based on a particular view of human nature, uh, one of my colleagues said, I would be very depressed if I saw the world that way, anticipating this negativity. And my answer was, it's not depressing, it's unsurprising. That's the way a constitutionalist looks at the rule of law. You create institutional protections so that if, when the negative side comes out. In other words, another way to think about it is, I can't guarantee you a courageous, virtuous states person is going to hold office, but I can guarantee you there will be some selfish, low, imperfect politicians. Given that, let's create the system to expect the worst and hope for the best. So he goes on to say, but what is government itself? but the greatest of all reflections on human nature. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. But we aren't perfect. And you don't even have to go to the level of saying that, you know, we're, we're nasty, poor, brutish, selfish, vicious, some of the things you get from Locke and Hobbes. Even if we're just a little, we're imperfect reasoners, as Madison says. If um, we tend to haggle over money, as Madison says in Fed 10, 
you might have enough of a reason there. We're just going to agree because our in, our interests don't naturally coincide. Um, then separation of powers and this, it's almost an internal warfare they're talking about from these uh, branches. So as we've seen, the avoidance of tyranny or the rule of law entails two things. Proper orientation to the appropriate ends, protection of rights, and secondly, appropriate procedures. And I've been focusing on the separation and blending of powers. Another protection I would say is also the words that comprise laws, the rule of law itself. Um, these laws and the words that make them up ought to be stable, not changeable based on the particular preference of the moment of whoever happens to be enforcing them. Now, um, Professor Knippenberg mentioned that I wrote a book on Title IX, and my observations about administrative law come from what I learned writing that book and how difficult it was just to find the original language of original laws. So what many of us may not be aware is that laws are enforced, a, a lot of laws are enforced by executive departments, departments in the executive office, and they're enforced by appointed individuals in the bureaucracy. Um, the, so as, as we've said, these laws aim to provide some kind of stability. When we look at the way laws are enforced today in the administrative branch of government, some call it the fourth branch, the bureaucracy, um, administrative agencies today have a lot of leeway to say what a law means in fact. So when you have to enforce a law, let's say you have Clean Air Act, and a new administration comes into office, they have to decide how many parts of particles per a distance do we accept as clean by the standard of this law, right? They have to come up with some basic uh, standards. Similarly with Title IX, as an example. And what I found in Title IX is that you have administrators tweaking the meaning of the law, and that's uh, maybe tweaking isn't the word, changing in very significant ways and adding requirements onto the law that weren't in the law as it was written. So most of you know Title IX probably today as a law that adjudicates sexual misconduct on college campuses. If we were having this conversation 10 years ago, we would think of it as a sports law. Would it surprise you to know that neither of these aspects of Title IX were in the original language of the document and it originally wasn't even known whether it would have anything to do with sports? It's a 37 word law that says no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits or be subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal assistance. Since its passage, what I learned was the bureaucrats in the executive branch and the US Supreme Court in a couple of uh, decisions have expanded its meaning. So today we can invoke this, not just for non-discrimination in programs and activities, but to receive protections against um, sexual harassment, numerical parity in athletics, um, suing for monetary damages when these things are violated, and a number of other things. Those changes have been enacted, and so those are additions to the law, not by Congress. Now, I know you all know this, um, but most Americans don't. We have one lawmaking branch, it's called Congress. Most people believe, many people believe when we're electing a president, we're electing a lawmaker. Congress is the primary body intending to make laws, they're the elected representatives of the people for that purpose. The change of this law happened by appointed officials in the bureaucracy, by the agency responsible for enforcing the law, the Office for Civil Rights in the Department of Education. Although the, the Supreme Court facilitated some of this, it was primarily in this process called rule making. So like with the Clean Air Act example I gave you, when a new administration comes in and they appoint individuals to the Office for Civil Rights, 
they come in and they have to inform colleges and universities across the country as well as K-12. Here's how we're interpreting Title IX. There's a little law called the Administrative Procedures Act that requires that all those rules must be consistent with the language, uh, statutory language of the laws. The reality is it often isn't. And how many of you know what your bureaucrats are doing? So what we have seen um, in the case of Title IX and its history is that you have appointed bureaucrats in the um, Office for Civil Rights creating new rules, enforcing them, judging when schools violating that, have violated them, and determining what the punishments ought to be in each of those cases. Is this not the very definition of tyranny that Madison talked about in Federalist 47, the uniting of lawmaking, enforcement, and judging in the same set of hands? So um, I would argue um, this is an area of law that we need to look very carefully at in the next several years and, and think about what this means. This type of administrative lawmaking um, is especially problematic because bureaucrats are largely unchecked. We don't, we can't, we can't name our own senator, let alone bureaucrat in DC. Um, can anybody name who they're trying to get appointed as the head of the Office for Civil Rights? Probably not. I mean, I know Joe knows, but, and I'm sure Dan and, and our other speaker does. Um, they're unelected. They're not seen by the public. Most of the public don't care what they're doing. Um, and um, most of us lack understanding in, in the work of bureaucracy. I have to tell you though, students, it's worth studying. You know, here, here's a little puzzle. You know, why are bureaucracies so inefficient and um, uh, private organizations like the McDonald's and the Starbucks so efficient? Uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting puzzle. Ultimately, um, we have to think about the importance of rule of law, both end goal and procedural. Is law not only serving and protecting the rights of the governed? I may like every single result of Title IX. I may think the awareness about sexual misconduct on campus is long overdue. A lot of people, a lot of people do. That isn't the same as thinking they're acting legitimately in going in that direction. And so I'm going to leave it with that question and, and maybe pose the question, does it matter if we get the end goal that we want, whether we go through it in the proper process or not? And I'll hand it over to our discussants. Well, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, I'm disappointed we can't be together in, in person. I love coming to Oglethorpe. I've been so many times. I think I need to attend Alex Blecker's graduation because we've been in five or six uh, courses, it, it seems, together. Uh, don't expect a big gift, though, Alex. Well, given its importance, it's, it's somewhat surprising that the, the phrase separation of powers doesn't actually appear in the Constitution. It's true, Articles 1, 2, and 3 begin by telling us the legislative power is here, the executive power is there, and the judicial power is over there. Article 1 actually is careful to say all legislative powers herein granted. Um, the, the absence of the definite article is, is really significant there. So still, while the Constitution doesn't expressly articulate what Professor Calford Bush has called its crucial principle, we could say it's obviously implied, and therefore it's redundant to spell it out. But the Constitution of Massachusetts which is older than the US Constitution and in a way was uh, it's a significant model for it, did spell it out. And here's what it said, I'm quoting, in the government of this commonwealth, the legislative department shall never 
exercise the executive and judicial powers or either of them. The executive shall never exercise the legislative and judicial powers or either of them. The judiciary shall never exercise the legislative and executive powers or either of them to the end that this may be a government of laws and not of men. And that ringing rationale is the starting point of Professor KB, for short, I'll call her that, that's what her students call her, uh, of her it's the starting point of her excellent exposition of the, the doctrine of the separation of powers. There's a theory behind the separation of powers. But notice how strict that Massachusetts language was. It reminds me of my instructions when I was handing over the car keys to my three teenagers who nevertheless subsequently managed to damage a Volvo, a Honda Civic, and a Toyota Corolla. But who's counting? I'm still driving the Corolla. It's noteworthy also, I think, that three of the last states to ratify the Constitution submitted amendments to get the following language included. The legislative, executive, and judicial power of government should be separate and distinct. The amendments didn't make the cut to the final 10 that became the, the Bill of Rights and probably because they were considered redundant. Still, it's interesting that they were proposed. That's how seriously um, states took that, that language. So in expounding the doctrinal background of the concept and Madison's application of it, Professor KB rightly stresses that in the modern doctrine of separation, the powers were not understood to be hermetically sealed off from one another. Why not? Because the natural tendency of power is to encroach a blend or a mixture of powers is paradoxically going to be more conducive to their ultimate separation and thus to the preservation of free government than trying to strictly cordon off each branch from the other would be. As Harvey Mansfield, one of our greatest interpreters of constitutionalism, explains it, it's safer to give the president a veto and to have Congress uh, with the ability to refuse executive appointments and things like that, because collision of institutional interests and powers is visible, collusion is always secret. So Professor Halford Bush poses a, a provocative question. Have we, we the people, lost interest in separation of powers? the app that was supposed to preserve our freedom? Are we normalizing tyranny by acquiescing in the administrative state in which bureaucratic agencies exercise what's called quasi-legislative and quasi-judicial powers? Should we be bothered by all that quasiness? Isn't it an acceptable adaptation to the complexities of the 21st century, an attempt to make government more competent, which Madison cared about? Isn't it just a superior blend, like that Portuguese red that I score at Costco for under $8 a bottle? It's right across the street from your, your uh, residences. You should check it out. Or should we reject all this quasiness as Google does. Type that into your browser. Seriously, I'll wait. Uh-huh. And Professor Calford Bush wants you to feel that queasiness about the administrative state. If you take constitutionalism seriously, something should make you want to throw up. Or and this would surely be better, stand up and protest the Congress's indifference to exercising its own powers 
because those are ultimately the people's powers. And the same is true of the executives. It's not that the people should themselves wield those powers. That was never the constitutional intention, but they are originally, and so one could say ultimately theirs. That's the truth of popular sovereignty. So I'll end by asking Professor Koffer Bush to reflect on something ripped from the headlines. How should we think about the president with the acquiescence of the Democratic Congress instructing OSHA to issue a rule requiring private sector employees in companies with more than 100 to get vaccinated or to submit, submit to the weekly unpleasantness of a COVID test? Should we take heart that people are quitting their jobs over this, wielding signs or emojis and GIFs resisting governmental tyranny? Or should we view the Biden pivot a few weeks ago, he said he didn't have statutory authority for uh, a, a vaccine mandate. Should we, should we view the pivot as a justifiable use of Lockean prerogative to protect the public in an emergency? And finally, what would James Madison say about all this? Given that he expected the problem to come from an overreaching legislative power rather than expanding executive and administrative power, might he now be somewhat sympathetic to the simpler and stricter constitutional language of separation that we saw in those proposed amendments to the Constitution that were deemed redundant then? Are they redundant now? Thanks. Thank you, Professor Crockett. All right, well, I thank you for having me to this uh, occasion. And uh, thanks for uh, Professor Coffer Bush's uh, comments. I think the focus on separation of powers and the normal normalization of tyranny was very interesting. I have nothing to complain about her comments. I'm in general concurrence with her thesis. Uh, the Constitution sets up and the Federalist Papers defend a system of separation of powers that should work to prevent tyrannical government. And that includes the goals of government as well as the process. And we should be equally concerned about both. And clearly the administrative state has, as it has evolved, creates some significant problems in this area, particularly the bureaucracy's seemingly unchecked ability to make rules and force them and adjudicate them without any check or balance. And I amusingly echo Professor Cullen's remarks that everyone thinks of the various aspects of pandemic politics, the ability of OSHA to impose a vaccine mandate on private businesses without any deliberative process in Congress seems, um, well, words fail me. Now, what I'd like to do with the brief time I have is to suggest an alternative path to this problem. It's not a way of correcting anything Professor Coffer Bush has said, but perhaps to add another layer to her analysis. And that's by focusing on the other goal of the separation of power system, which is in addition to preventing tyrannical government, preventing incompetent government. It's very common in discussions of separation of powers to focus on the threat of tyranny. That's the primary focus of Federalist 47 through 51, but equally important to the Constitution's framers, perhaps even more so given that the actual impetus for the Constitutional Convention was governing incompetence under the Articles of Confederation was the problem of effective governance. And just as the separation of power system serves to prevent tyrannical government, it also serves to foster effective governance. And we see this in the structural features of the different branches of government, which were designed to perform different functions in our system. For example, the function of Congress is to enact laws, to Hamilton's words from Federalist 75, to prescribe rules for the regulation of the society. It seeks the popular will as that will is modified and refined in a way conducive to the common good. And it does this through deliberation. And deliberation is made more likely by populating Congress with many representatives in two chambers of different sizes, chosen in different ways for different lengths of time. The function of the presidency is, to quote Hamilton again, to execute the laws of the land and to employ the common strength. 
So the president clarifies goals and responds to crises and executes the laws. The quality the president needs to do these things is energy, and we get energy by populating this institution with one person. And that person can, in turn, act with speed and expedition, something that you do not get with a plural executive. Finally, the function of the judicial branch is to protect our rights and liberties through an adjudication process. Quoting Hamilton again, this time from Federalist Number 78, exercising judgment, not will. Therefore, we staff this branch with a small body of learned experts who have relative job security, and that way they can make decisions interpreting the law presumably free of popular or political pressures. Now, there are natural and inevitable tensions that exist among these different functions. Response to the popular will can run at cross purposes with the protection of individual rights and liberties. And there's an obvious similar conflict between security concerns and individual rights and liberties, especially we see this in the last 20 years since 9-11. And a healthy separation of power system will regulate that natural and inevitable tension as the different branches push and pull against each other from issue to issue. But as long as we see the three general qualities represented in our system, deliberation, energy, and judgment, the separation of power system is working. So here's my concern. What if some of the structural features of our separation of power system designed to provide more effective governance have become perverted or corrupted over time in a way that leads to this normalization of tyranny that Professor Copper Bush talks about? For example, did the change a little over 100 years ago to select US senators through a popular vote make the Senate more like the House and subsequently alter the basic character of the Senate in a way that diminished its deliberative quality? Did the change a little over 50 years ago to shift to a predominantly plebiscitary nomination system for the presidency through popular primaries alter the character of that institution to make it more populist and less independent of the popular will? And maybe more pertinent to our topic here, did the different executive branch goals execute the law, employ the common strength, did they merge in the progressive era with the development and growth of the administrative state? The presidency is designed to employ the common strength during times of crisis. But if one of the goals of the progressive era was the normalization of crisis politics, is it possible that the ability to employ the common strength has infected the enforce the law job of the president? In other words, has the presidency's tendency to absorb power in an emergency now metastasized as we see emergencies everywhere? After all, political leaders say things like, never let a good crisis go to waste. And that sentiment allows power to flow to the executive and prompts Congress to delegate or cede power to the bureaucracy. And that would mean that one of the problems of our system is the structure itself. This differentiation of function and structure has been used by political leaders with various goals to corrupt the very purposes for which it was created. I want to close with impossible sorts for this problem. The principles of our constitutional republic are not self-interpreting. These structural features require real human beings to inhabit these institutions and operationalize these principles. So Theodore Roosevelt had a creative perspective on the use of presidential power. He saw the president, and I'm quoting him, as a steward of the people with the right and duty, quote, to do anything that the needs of the nation demanded unless such action was forbidden by the Constitution or by the laws. And he claimed that he acted for public, the public welfare, doing whatever was necessary unless prevented by direct constitutional or legislative prohibitions. In other words, Roosevelt thought the president can do whatever is necessary for the public interest unless either the Constitution or congressional statute explicitly forbids it. And it's safe to say that the longer he thought about this, especially as he sought a return to power in 1912, the less he cared about the niceties of separation of powers. Roosevelt's successor, William Howard Taft, generally supported Roosevelt's desire for political reform, at least until he wrote off the cliff in 1912, but Taft's perspective on the process was quite different from Roosevelt's. 
Taft believed Roosevelt's position was, and I quote Taft, an unsafe doctrine that could lead to unlimited power. Instead, Taft argued that, quote, the president can exercise no power which cannot be fairly and reasonably traced to some specific grant of power, and that power must be either in the federal constitution or in an act of Congress passed in pursuance thereof. In other words, the president must connect his actions to a specific source of authority, constitutional or statutory. He can't just do something because he thinks it's in the public interest. And that would include the bureaucracy, and Taft was very interested in administrative reform. Now, in the long run, it's very clear that Roosevelt won the battle between these two men. But I would suggest that it is his victory, an expansive interpretation of presidential power tied to the administrative powers of the state, that has given us the situation described by Professor Popper Bush. Taft's focus on the importance of Republican processes might have allowed us to establish an administrative system more consistent with the constitutional principles envisioned by the framers. Now, I don't have an answer for how we can go back to that decision point. I think Taft represents an ignored option or a lost opportunity overwhelmed by the more charismatic examples of his predecessor and successor, Roosevelt and Wilson. But there is a part of me that fears that all of this is baked into the system. Aristotle taught us that the dominant principles of a regime may actually work against the health and vitality of that regime. And in the case of the United States, perhaps this came in the form of making the legislature weaker than it normally would be in a republic or making the presidency stronger than it normally would be in a republic. And it may be that the framers' own desire to prevent incompetent government has led us to this normalization of tyranny as much as their desire to prevent tyranny did. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Crawford, do you want to respond to these comments? Um. Yeah, so I'll start with the last comment, the question, um, what if the structural features have been corrupted to the point that the normalization of tyranny is just the net result, that it's baked into the system, as you say? I, th I think that's a really good question, and I think the locus of error right now is with Congress refusing to do its job. Um, uh, you know, we just celebrated the 20th anniversary of the September 11th attack. And if you look at the growth of presidential power over those 20 years and even 10 years prior to that, in fear of the next election, um, Congress persons don't want to go on the record for controversial topics. And so they cede the authority. Um, I heard over and over the longest war in US history, but I'm thinking about it and I don't remember Congress declaring war for either Iraq or Afghanistan. I know they authorized the use of force and so forth. So to not even go on the record when everyone knows, you know, we're, we're clearly fighting a war. Um, so, and I don't have an answer to this either, but it, it strikes me that the, the locus of the problem might have to do with needing some sort of congressional reforms, whether it's the, the nature of the Senate has changed. I, I know some people talk about term limits. Again, I'm not, I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's something we should think about um, rather than saying, well, Congress is incompetent, Congress isn't corrupt, Congress won't compromise, therefore let's just get it any way we can, um, it, it, it seems to me is not the way to go. Um, I, over time, as, as I've taught the Federalist Papers more and more, I think the crisis today is not the polarization politically, it is a disagreement over whether the rule of law even matters at all. So that when we're debating things like due process for individuals accused of sexual misconduct on campus, some people want to throw the book at them because it's heinous crime and other, people's be other people believe in rule of law and you give due process, especially to those that you maybe don't want to give it, give it to. So um, 
uh, that problem, I think, is infecting a lot of our political discourse. And by the way, it's folks on the left and the right who can uh, be uh, 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 challenging this notion that, that the law matters. Um, to the and to, to Dan, I want to thank you for asking me about vaccination because everyone wants to go on the record with <laughs> you on vaccination, but it's a good question. So I think the example that you give, um, how should we think about a president who institutes a lot? And if I'm reading your question properly, um, you're asking, it seems pretty clearly not to be in the constitutional authority. And so what are we to think about then imposing it because a lot of people want to expand the vaccination rate and you could have easily asked the same question about the CDC banning evictions. And after the Supreme Court spoke on the topic of banning evictions, um, President Biden came out and said, um, well, this might not exactly pass constitutional muster, but we're going to do it anyway. Liz, let me just let me clarify something that it's my view isn't that it's it's likely an unconstitutional move. I, I think a, a pretty strong case could be made for it under the commerce power. But the, the point is, shouldn't the Congress be doing it okay. rather than OSHA, you know, trying to twist uh, an arcane and, and little used uh, emergency, emergency provision. I actually think Make that's the Congress really do their job and own it. That Yeah, I well, I would certainly say Congress needs to do their job more than they do. <laughs> um, I actually think there's an interesting constitutional question on the issue of emergency powers in a pandemic though. I think, I think a national emergency is a time in which you could trigger that energy and action at the executive level. Now, OSHA is an agency, it's not the president, but the president's directing OSHA to do it. Um, the way I understand presidential energy is, it's triggered mostly in times of crisis that we need pretty immediate action. Now we're in a pandemic that's stretched on for 18 months. So one could ask the question, does it need to drop immediately or is there time for like a month of debate in Congress? At this point, probably time for a month of debate in Congress if they, if they could come to some settlement at that point. You know, usually I think about it in terms of national security, but certainly a pandemic, um, again, not to argue for or against the closing down of everything back in March, 2020. I mean, it seems to me that could be an appropriate time for an executive to step in. We don't know what this thing is. We don't know how it's spreading. So given the Delta variant and its unpredictability and the new land and whatnot, um, it's, I'm sort of on the fence about it. My heart of hearts, I think it's appropriate for, for elected officials, the people's representatives to debate and come to some compromise on these things. They do seem incapable of doing so. And there is a little bit of an argument in this case that emergency powers are triggered because we're in a national pandemic. Does that make sense? Do any of the students have any questions? <clears throat> if not, I'm going to pose a question to all three panelists and then uh, maybe the students will be inspired by my question. Uh, Professor Coffer Bush began by talking about the way in which uh, separation of powers gave us both uh, competent government and uh, uh, representative government. And when I uh, think about it, I'm tempted to make the following claim. Uh, certainly in the Federalist Papers, we uh, see the argument that energy resides in the executive branch. <clears throat> 
Uh, it's also tempting to say, we hear from apologists for the administrative state that wisdom or expertise reside in the executive branch, not in uh, Congress. If what we want is both energy and wisdom or energy and expertise, don't, don't we really want just executive government? Uh, what does Congress give us that's good from government? Why do we need separation of powers? Why can't we just have you know, smart people running things effectively? And I'll leave it, I'll, I'll shut up there and, and let you all have a whack at that. Well, my temptation is to say, of course, that uh, at some point, President George would then become King George III, and there's no guarantee. Uh, if you could guarantee enlightened statesmen would always be at the helm, then your suggestion, of course, would be uh, perhaps uh, laudatory, but we can't guarantee that. And I don't know that there's anything about the presidency that immunizes him from corruption, depravity, um, than any other branch. So that separation of powers is there because the presidency is just as susceptible to tyrannical activities as the other branches are. I guess I would attack the question in a slightly different way that the process is part of the rule of law. And it's one thing to think we want a certain result and we want it to come efficiently. And it's another thing to think that you're acting legitimately in doing it that way. And there's a gulf between the two. I think it does matter. I, I'm, I'm constantly brought back to Lincoln's Lyceum Address, which when I teach it in an intro class, I boil it down to, to Lincoln giving us a choice. You can live in a society based on rule of law or a lawless society. And those are the, your options. And process is part of the rule of law and it matters. Now, that doesn't mean, and I'm not saying the constitution is perfect and I'm not saying um, that there isn't legitimate reason to, to look at changing a number of, of processes. And it's also the case that administrators have to make some of these difficult decisions to, to make law function at all. Um, but the way in which we um, do these things absolutely matters. And uh, we need a lot more teaching of basic civics so people understand just what even the constitution is. It is a set of laws when it's designing the branches in this way. Well, Joe, I would say it's a really good question because who's gonna deny that we have presidential government as a fact? And Madison himself um, would, have, would have agreed that the great innovation or one of the two great innovations of the constitution was it was going to um, provide for the executive power that republics just could never manage by republicanizing the executive as uh, Harvey Mansfield puts it. Okay. Hamilton was correct on June 18th that uh, if not a monarchy, a monarchical power had to had to be part of of the system, or else effective government was was not going to be possible. But how to come up with a republican version of that, which was unprecedented, that was the that was the trick. And I, I don't mean that it was it was uh, literally a trick, but that was the that was the the genius. What we expected was that the branches would practice constitutional politics, that they really would defend their, their institutional interests. And while we see a version of that going on, interestingly, with the court right now, it looks like Congress um, doesn't, doesn't want to engage in that, in that battle. Otherwise, wouldn't we have had a different outcome with the, the two last impeachments. 
our friend Yuval Levin says that uh, Congress is now more, members of Congress are more interested in performance than taking care of their institutional interests and doing that job. So it may be that presidential government is, is a fact, and yet given that it would be prudent to do all the things, emphasize all the things that Liz has, has mentioned today, because that's where we expect the excess is going to come now, not from the legislative branch. But is, that, but is anybody going to recommit to the constitutional politics that was implicit, implicit in the original scheme? I'm, I'm discouraged about that prospect. I would throw in one more small thing, not small in importance, but I mean, what Congress gives us is that Republican nature <laughs> that is talked about in Fed 39, um, the, the will of the people. I mean, we elect these, the, these people are elected every two and every six years. Now, certainly we should look at the electoral process and, you know, th th there's a lot that isn't perfect there as well, but you need that underlying consent base and the appointment of experts doesn't that is, even though Madison says technically it's sufficient to have someone who's appointed and um, uh, serving not for life, but for good behavior, it is further and further removed. And so I think that is important that lawmaking, at least in part, has that closeness to the people. Let me jump in here and, and say a couple of things. I was thinking about this we can speak sometimes of the constituents of, of good government in a kind of simple way of being, you know, wisdom and consent. Congress, you've just argued, gives us the consent part of it. Uh, in some ways, it does seem to me that uh, the argument in the Federalist Papers is that Congress also gives us the wisdom part of it, uh, or is supposed to give us the wisdom part of it, because, you know, I recall, and I can't remember which Federalist it is, you've, you've thought the Federalist more recently than I have. Probably everyone here who's teaching has thought the Federalist more recently than I have. Uh, you know, a representative has to know something about the, the nature of his or her constituency and of the interests of his or her constituents. And when we speak of Congress as deliberative, we're, uh, we speak of them as reasoning together. Uh, the laws are supposed to be good laws which embody a kind of good judgment and knowledge. Now, the, I don't recall anywhere in the Federalist Papers anyone saying the president's great attribute is the president's expertise. The, the great attribute of the presidency is energy. So if we're going to have you know, the wise direction of energy, we're going to have to have a separation of powers. We're going to have to have wisdom in Congress, energy in the presidency. I mean, I'm, I'm vastly oversimplifying. I know that. We have taken a wrong turn, and I think uh, Professor Crockett has pointed to us where this turn took place in the debate between Roosevelt and Taft, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, because it seems to me now, as I said, uh, the claim is that the expertise exists in the executive branch and that Congress may still be a kind of vehicle for winning the consent of the people, but uh, that consent is not tied to Congress's expertise anymore. It doesn't inform Congress's expertise. It's just uh, essentially could be a kind of smokescreen for you know, the experts behind the curtain, so to speak. Um, Professor Crockett also mentioned um, the change in the Senate. And I don't recall the Federalist Papers talking about Congress as wise, but I think I recall the Senate um, being the deliberative body primarily. Yeah, it's in the Federalist 62 and 63. Yeah, yeah. And so it seem, does seem to me that that amendment <clears throat> changing the electoral process of the Senate might change its nature. I think you were alluding to this in a way that it doesn't perhaps operate the same way it was intended, which 
could be fine, but it it may be something to look at. I, I don't think we could ever go back to the way it was. Um, but given that its nature is different, what kind of reforms for congressional selection or term limits or something else or procedures could be made to make it more deliberative would be the question I guess I would ask. And Garen has a question. You have the floor, Garen. All right, uh, can you hear me fine? Okay, so it's kind of a long one. Um, so does the current state of political affairs and the refusal of the executive branch to stay in its lane and the legislative branch uh, to fulfill its role effectively suggest any fundamental problems in the way that the government is currently structured? Is there a legitimate waterproof way for uh, restructuring the system uh, that cannot be simply undone to reduce the self-interest of the executive and legislative and judicial branches uh, without limiting the rights of, uh, you know, the individuals that compose those branches? I think Madison's point is you can't reduce self-interest and then you dangle power there and it gets, it gets worse. So, um, but maybe structurally, I think you mean that maybe moderate uh, the self-interest. Um, there's a problem with how it's functioning today, which does suggest that maybe some reforms or amendments might need to be made. Uh, I think the president is taking the power that Congress is laying on a platter <laughs> out to the president right now. Um, we don't want to declare war, so we'll let you figure out what you're going to do in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and, and, and so forth, instead of going on the record. Um, what those changes need to be, again, I think we need to have a long conversation about. Let me suggest this, that, that if, if there's an app for this, it's going to have to involve the, the people because if it's true that the powers that we're talking about belong to the people, which I think is what Republican theory commits us, us to, it's up to the people in, in the same way that it's up to me to uh, rebalance my, my pitiful um, TIAA portfolio when new risks appear on the horizon. I can become more conservative about uh, one part of my, my balance sheet or more aggressive with one. And we're, we're facing the question whether people care uh, to use Liz's term, whether things are done with, with due process or done constitutionally, or do we only care that something is done that we happen to prefer? If, if it's the latter, then I think the, um, the constitutional experiment fails. It's, it's as simple as that. So, there is a really good argument in favor of the discipline of constitutionalism, and Liz made it this afternoon. It's not very well understood. We don't teach it. Uh, we need to. We need to do more. That doesn't. That doesn't mean it's going to be successful. But I think that's the only path forward that I can see. I also think there's a misunderstanding that. Congress needs to constantly be doing things. It's actually maybe preferable that they don't, <laughs> but they're not checking the president and they're not checking the administrative states in a way that Madison anticipated they would given their ambition. I think the whole structure relies on the ambition, counteracting ambition, and Congress seems to have lost its institutional pride uh, I don't know if that's because of polarization, so the parties in Congress are wedded to either the president or the alternative. It's been a long time developing from the progressive era, which saw sort of a denigration of politics, and we need to understand that politics is not a bad word, it's not a nasty thing, but it's going to require the political class to recapture 
what they are about as an institution. And that requires crossing partisan differences because it's about the institution. So I, I think it's also worth asking how much historical sense they have about the institution itself. How much do they actually know about the institutions they're running? Um, maybe not as much as they should. Let me ask you this strange question, Liz. Uh, Congress is flexing its institutional muscles against the other co-equal branch of government. And um, Judiciary? is there possibly a silver lining in the fact that the, the Congress is, is aggressively asserting itself or threatening to against the judiciary? You and I would probably agree that um, that's, a, that's a bad thing. But there, it seems to me, they're at least playing something closer to the originally expected role of an institution indeed you know, being being on the make, but if all the others were were vigilant and and assertive themselves, then a kind of equilibrium could be established. Yeah, I mean, it's the executive power, they seem to have have folded in favor of policy victories. Yeah, it's interesting. The check that's being talked about, which would be what packing the court, um, they're looking at with the assumption that a judge is there to be a legislator. <laughs> so they want to pack the court with legislators friendly to their point of view to go beyond legitimate judicial constitutional authority. So again, you still, you're still not passing the smell test constitutionally but is it legitimate to ask whether the number of justices should be changed? Absolutely. But if you do it for the sake of specific desired policies with the assumption of judicial legislation, which Hamilton called judicial tyranny in, in Fed 78, um, you're opening the door for that to happen every time there's um, an ugly political disagreement. So yeah, it's it's, the question of whether the, the judiciary needs to be checked is a good and healthy one. The motivation is an unconstitutional motivation, I would say. Agree. Well, any, any last question or last word from any of our panelists? If not, I'd like to thank our panelists, Dr. Coffer Bush, Dr. Cullen, Dr. Crockett, for spending uh, part of their afternoon with us. And uh, thank again the Jack Miller Center for uh, so generously supporting this Constitution Day program so that we can explore all these important constitutional questions. And thank the students for uh, providing an audience for our conversation and uh, contributing to it as well. Uh, those of you who are my students know what you have to do. And uh, if you have any questions about that or questions that you think of that you want me to direct to the panelists, I'm happy to do that later. Uh, if not, I'm going to uh, sign you off. I'd ask the panelists to stick around for a minute or two, but uh, everyone else is free to go. <laughs>